Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest of our series. I've lost track now. We've been running them since August uh, 2020, and it's great to see so many people join us tonight for the first of three talks by our some of our latest fellows. Uh, tonight we have Ken Holland, FRPS, uh, and next month we're going to have Alexandra Prescott, FRPS, and in the following months, uh, Carol Ollerud, uh, FRPS, and they'll each be taking us through their journey of uh, achieving their fellowship. Uh, I've known Ken now for a couple of years, a bit more, uh, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's talk. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to you, Ken. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, I'll first of all get my screen share up. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, I cannot believe two years ago that I would be doing this. Um, never mind having the letters FRPS after my de my name. So uh, I think we can blame lockdown for this because the whole project where I, that I started, I really started about six months before lockdown, but it, I think it was lockdown that. Can. Can, sorry to interrupt. You have, yep. You're not sharing. I'm not sharing. Okay. Um, should be. Um, let's try again. That's it. Yep. Got it this time? Yes. I don't know what happened there. Apologies for that. Yep, you can see the title slide, I hope. Good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so th this, this project began purely for myself. Um, and when lockdown came, I thought this is the, the one and only chance I'm going to have to have another go at uh, an FRPS. I did try many, many years ago and wasn't successful. So this is a whole new project. Um, and before I show you the, the, the panel, um, I'll give you a little bit of background to, to who Hannah was and, and why I actually decided to make a project out of the whole thing. Um, Hannah is Dame Hannah Rogers. Um, she, she was um, left a lot of money in, in, um, by her husband when he died. He was an MP and she lived in Plymouth and in her will when she died, quite a wealthy woman, she left 10,000 pounds to help poor and unfortunate young people in Plymouth. Um, and it carried on that way until 1925 when a school was opened um, near Plymouth, it's still there. Um, and as the school developed, they took on another site, which is the site that you'll see this evening um, and it was called Hannah's at Seal Hain. And Seal Hain used to be an agricultural college. It's near Newton Abbott, which is near where I live in, in Devon. Um, and it opened in 2010, but things didn't go terribly well. It was a very expensive site to maintain. And in the end, they, being a charity, they couldn't afford to lose money. So it was closed. Um, th that campus is still, still there, but it's now been bought and it is now becoming um, used in other ways and the school campus um, is also open but it's not a school any longer it's now stopped being a school it's now a residential um, place so that's a little bit of background just to give you an idea and that's the dear lady that is Hannah that's Dame Hannah Rogers um, I think copied from a very old painting but now on the side of the wall um, at Seal Hain um, and this was taken several years before I started the project when, when Hannah's was really going quite well as a charity and uh, as a place that was helping um, young adults. And these young adults had a range of disabilities. Some, some had learning difficulties and some had physical um, problems and issues, but um, it was a really lovely place to work. And that, that will give you an idea of what the building was. Um, and on a really bright sunny day, it, is, it was the most gorgeous building, but as you can see, 
very, very expensive building to maintain. And eventually that's what caused them some problems. It was a College of Agriculture, a very well known one and had been going for a long time. So at Seal Hayne itself, um, years ago now, um, my camera club and, uh, and myself, we were lucky and, and to be invited to be able to record some of the, the things that went on. And these are some of the lovely people that we met over the years and that, that I was lucky enough to photograph. Um, this young lady in her wheelchair. Um, and this, this was, was the way of life. Everybody smiled. It was just one of those places. Um, they had a little farm which they used to grow food. A lot of the food was used in the bistro where they um, actually sold meals to actually raise money towards the charity. So this was in the, the work working um, house that with the shed by the farm. This lovely young lady worked as a, a waitress in the bistro. Um, I think she was one of the first people that I met at Hannah's and she had the most lovely smile. She was here DJing at, a, at a, um, an outdoor event. And this, this young man was so proud, he'd grown those runner beans himself. That's the first thing he'd, he'd grown and the beans are behind him and he'd grown them in a, in a, a, a polytunnel. Uh, this, this guy was busy gardening. That was his lovely smile that he gave me. And uh, this actually was one of the staff, but um, again, all good fun on Halloween evening, she, or afternoon, she was setting up for Halloween. But uh, besides being um, a place where, where um, say, young people could go, they also had to raise money. And one of the ways they did it was to hold exhibitions. They had a big exhibition hall there. Um, this was a sort of a very futuristic exhibition that was, was held. These are just people going around looking. And of a more serious nature, this was the uh, remembrance um, display that was held back in 2017. So all sorts of exhibitions were held there. And as well as that, there were, there were people that rented rooms and um, all sorts of things went on. And again, the rent helped Hannah's to make an income. I was very lucky to, on several occasions to photograph these Tycho drummers. And in the end, they actually asked me to, to uh, photograph them again for their website. Um, so these, these uh, were all part of, uh, of what I was asked to do, not actually very long ago. These were all, these were taken only a few months ago. Um, and people rented rooms to work in. Again, that would bring an income. Um, quite artistic um, artists and craftspeople. Uh, this man is making flies for fishing. Um, and that's his workshop. You could hardly, I could hardly get in there to photograph him, but he's tie, actually tying a fly there. Uh, a very good picture framing workshop. He also uh, printed off photographs and, and artwork for people. If you notice at the top over the, over the door, the three ducks and those ducks are, are iconic to Hannah's. It was their logo was the Indian runner duck. Um, recently, there's opened um, a, a bicycle. I thought it was a shop, but actually, no, they, they have people in there learning to do um, the, all the technical things that, that bikes need doing these days. Um, and this was one of the students actually learning how to make a wheel. Uh, the Down Syndrome Association, their Devon branch has their, their offices here. They rent some rooms as well. This young lady is the uh, person who's the manager. And when the place closed back in 2019, the, the coffee shop closed and it's now just reopened again. In fact, it only took this a few weeks ago and uh, that, that's, it's going, but nothing to do with Hannah's now. It's all run privately, um, but still very good. really quite difficult for Hannah's. Um, and in the end, it was decided to close the, um, uh, the whole site. And they had to remove all of the items. Now I'd worked in, in Hannah's 
um, I'd run photo courses and, and um, really enjoyed going into the bistro and to all sorts of things that went on to, to performances. And, and um, I, I decided when it closed that I would go in and start photographing everything as it was. I don't know why, but I just felt the need to do it. And on the day it closed, the end of July 2019, um, I went in and actually took this on, on the way in, uh, which sort of said it all, really, that, um, you know, the entrance is up the road, but there certainly was a skid risk for, for Hannah's. It was a bit too late. It skidded out of control. And all, already you could see the site itself was beginning to look a little sad and um, neglected. It, it needed huge work on the upkeep and just maintenance and just cleaning it and keeping it looking fresh and tidy. Um, bit by bit, it really did look quite sad. I was quite upset to see it like this. Um, and already one or two things were getting to be thrown out, the old chairs and so on, which had really passed their usable date. Um, and this, you know, was not that long ago used and a lovely place to sit in the sun outside now quite neglected and get being quite used to seeing people sitting here enjoying coffees and, and talking and having meetings the place just became quite empty um and i'm glad i took this photo that plaque there it said it was opened by princess anne in 2010 there's a little piece on the top that you can't see but for me it's the the Indian runner duck who's just leaving, leaving home, walking out. So you can see that things really were going downhill. Um, bit by bit, things were taken out of cupboards, out of rooms, uh, bits and pieces were left as they were, some not wanted. And, and I just thought it's a shame that a photograph of somebody who obviously was one of the, the clients that goes there um, he would be left behind um, and I didn't set anything up I didn't move anything I just photographed what I saw say so bits being piled up ready to be to be moved and wherever I went it started to speak to me a little bit and I began to think of the, the time when I actually finished teaching. My teaching career ended and walking around the school when I left on that last day, um, it sort of brought it back. And that's be what began to give me the inspiration for doing the panel itself. And just jumbles of things. I couldn't understand. They had 500 prints made to sell in the shop to make money. Um, of a lovely watercolour painting. And I guess out of the 500 that were made, I would think probably 450 were still left, just left there. I have no idea um, what happened to them. And little, little stories that uh, they, they'd obviously put on plays and performances, and there, there was a little bookshop where they used to sell things. Um, so quite sad when you think of the work that had actually gone in uh, to making all these different things and now just left, just forgotten. But uh, I did go round and by now, technically, I was trespassing 31st of July. The whole site was brought, brought up by a private developer um, and that is still the case now. You can go into the site because, the, let's say, there are places in there now that are open, but no sign that Hannah's was ever there. Every Reference to Hannah's is now gone. Um, interesting, um, one or two people have seen this image before and I was advised not to use it in my panel, quite rightly, I think, because it looked like it was sort of set up um, and it wasn't. It, I, I, the people that know me will know that I, I don't just don't set up photographs like this that is exactly as I found it and that's why I took it but um, I think be because of my panel and being advised not to use it I can quite understand so I took the advice I was given um, and didn't use it but to me it's still one of the most meaningful images 
um, that I took out of all the hundreds that I actually made uh, during the time I was photographing there. Uh, but odd little things, the more I went round and I, I made so many different visits, I kept finding little, little things that just caught my eye and bit by bit, I began to think, yeah, this is, uh, it, it is, it's reminiscent of, of when I've, I finally left, left teaching. Uh, little things that you see that the children have made, children have done, not necessarily their best work or artistic or anything, but to them, it meant something. Um, and now it's just, it's going, most of this would have gone to the tip. They, they did save. Um, quite a lot of things that were useful to take them back to the school, but a lot of what we've seen here like this would all have gone into, uh, into the skip to be taken away. Um, I think these would have gone to the school because they had a very, very good wardrobe um, that they used for um, plays and performances or for role play, dressing up, um, all on racks, but the thing that caught my eye more than anything was this polar bear um, and what made it even slightly more bizarre was the fact that he'd got a, a Santa hat on um, and you'll see him again in a moment. But he was actually standing on the edge of the stage, almost like he was sort of conducting, conducting the audience. There he is. Now, this is the main hall, and it's a huge, huge hall. And for a, a small charity, you can see already the size of it. It made the upkeep of the place very difficult. And they did put on performances, um, and they would put chairs out and they would fill it. Uh, we've been to concerts in there before now. And um, it, was a, it was a joyous occasion, but it's a very, very expensive building to keep running when you've just got this and so many other other rooms but they used this um, because it was quite near to where the the car park was and they could easily transport all the things that were here and worth keeping and actually put them into the skip to take them away um, one of the things that that caught me more than anything I think was the number of chairs there were chairs everywhere and uh, different sorts of easy chairs and formal chairs, all sorts of things. And uh, that was it. And to me, it, it, it was, would not have worked in my panel whatsoever because my panel is, as you'll see in a minute, is full of very personal observations. But this, in a sense, sums it up. This is the way that Hannah's finished at Seal Hain. Very, very sad. And from that, just down to odd little details that I started photographing, just this, <clears throat> again, sort of said it all, just the empty coat hanger. It's like, well, I've taken my coat, I've switched the light off, the fire alarm's disabled, I'm off, I'm gone. Um, and that was, to me, almost like, well, that's the end of the story. So this is all, really background to, to how I put my, my panel together. So this is one of the skips. Um, so you can see it absolutely stuffed full, mostly with usable things. Um, I still think some of it would have been thrown out. Even things like Christmas decorations, they, they might well have used, but there were things like PA amplifiers, there was um, musical equipment, all sorts of things that were worth keeping. Um, even cups and saucers and plates. Uh, I really don't know where it went, but I'm hoping most of it was used again. Um, this is one of the skips partly filled as well. Um, and during this time when I was going round, uh, I did get questioned a few times because say it was a private site by now. It was nothing at all to do with Hannah's. It had been sold. Uh, a private developer had bought it and was planning to do it up. There was a site foreman, site manager, um, and quite a few workmen there. And several times they asked what I was doing. 
And I said, well, I'm just, just photographing and at that time for myself. Oh, why? Um, and I said, yeah, I just, just need to do it. I, I, I've, you know, I've spent many happy hours here and I'm finding it sad. And most of the time they were pretty good. But the longer I went on, I think the more keen they were to see me leave. <laughs> so this is it. Um, you know, you want to hear more about my panel than about Hannah's, I guess. So, yeah, I, I was photographing it totally for myself, just for my own peace of mind, possibly. Um, and I thought maybe I might make a little book or just make a few small prints that I might show or keep or use, um, possibly an exhibition. But I think looking back on it, I don't know that it would work as an exhibition, but um, I welcome comments on that later if you think it might, I, I, we all see. Um, and that was from July 2019 right through to the end of that year. Um, and at the end of that year in December, um, we were away for nearly two months in Australia visiting my brother. So I finished photographing, that was it. I decided that was enough and came back um, at the end of January and got ourselves sorted and back on an even keel as you do after a few weeks away. And we were into lockdown pretty soon after and it was obvious it was going to take a while to get through lockdown and I thought, well, I've got time. I'm going to start putting some work together and bit by bit, I decided that this is the chance I have to have a go at a fellowship. Um, or even though I'd said many years ago, I'd never try again. But uh, thanks to my wife, Rosie, and, and I said to her, shall I, shall I, can I go through all this again? But bless her, she said, well, if you want to do it, you do it. And uh, she was very supportive. So I hope you can read the whole thing. This is, I, I, I don't like putting loads of words up, but with contemporary, of course, the statement is all important. So I will, I will leave you just to read that through for a minute. I, I've tried to make it as sort of readable as I can, just putting sentences across the screen. Um, and I can talk about it a little bit as well. The, um, the quote at the top, actually I picked out from television, it was on a TV programme. And I was thinking about my statement and I heard that and I very quickly jumped out of the room and scribbled it down while I remembered it. Um, that was exactly what I was looking for. And it is exactly in, in one sentence, exactly what I was trying to convey in my panel. So yeah, I, I finished teaching quite a few years ago and, and I just literally burned myself out with stress. I was tired and all the rest and, and it was time to finish. Uh, and it was it was really, really sad and deeply um, upsetting to walk around a, a school where you've been happy f on the last day. Um, and I won't remember that. I won't forget that day. Um, and that's why later on, yeah, I, I was going around Hannah's and it all came back to me. And I went back and where I was working, what you've seen, have all been filmed or photographed in, in, in semi-darkness. There was no natural light coming through some of the windows, certainly no um, artificial light at all. And I kept thinking about Hannah and those ducks leaving home because those ducks were everywhere. Wherever you went around Hannah's, there were pictures of ducks. Um, and when I'd finished teaching, uh, and actually, while well, before I'd finished, I, I'd, I'd had a few counselling sessions and they sort of worked. But I remember one, the, the counsellor saying it, when you're counselling, it's like opening the layers of an onion, peeling them back. And the further in you go, the, the deeper those feelings are. And, and this counsellor was she was trying to to get to the centre. And I never really felt that it was working as well as I would have liked it to. Um, it, yeah, it was to a point, but eventually I, I began to realise that what I was photographing was actually working better 
for me. Um, and I found that the whole project really helped me with my, my stress, my anxiety that I hadn't realized had sort of traveled with me for quite a few years. So as I went in deeper from photographing corridors and rooms right into the close-ups of personal belongings that they were almost mirroring what I was feeling. So in a minute, when you see the panel arrangement, you realize that the panel is arranged like that onion, that the outer edges are, are the, the corridors. And going towards the middle, we go into the rooms and right in the center, things are much closer. So that's the way I arranged that panel. Um, and one of the things I was advised to do is to say in, in my statement, well, what, how has it helped you? And it certainly has. And the more I wrote the panel, the, uh, the statement and, and rewrote it, the more it was helping me to sort of accept things that had happened. And I realized that I was working much more mindfully. I was looking at things in a different way and taking my time um, and working in a very silent place that obviously used to be very happy. So doing what I did, I think, um, has actually released some of the stress that, that counselling sort of helped with, but didn't do it quite as well for me. You know, I'm not knocking counselling at all. I think it's very valuable. Um, but this work, for me, worked a lot better. And it was probably more therapeutic than, than using words. That, that I, I'm a visual person, and I think the, the photographs here worked better than words. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, apologies for so many words. We'll get on to some photographs again, because it is a photographic talk. Now, how did I start to think about, well, how do I put a panel together? It's the most, the most difficult step is the first one. So I'm very lucky in, in town. Um, I have a good friend who, who runs a, a photo printing service, um, not like a one hour lab or anything like that. He, he does do some beautiful prints, but I just took in about 60 prints uh, or images on a memory stick and said to Chaz, please just print these off about eight by six. I'm not fussed about the quality or anything. Um, they're all black and white, but they came out with a slight magenta feel on every single one. It didn't matter. And out of the 60, I whittled it down. Um, and that's very hard to, to take out some of the images that you think are your better ones. Um, to actually make a panel and they've got to work as a panel. So that was my very, very first attempt, lying on, a, on the floor of the, the spare room. And I left them out for several weeks. And every time um, I went in, I would probably change one or two or swap them around and think, do they work? And actually now looking at these, there are some here that didn't end up in my final panel. Um, for several reasons, um, and bit by bit, it, it changed. And you can see, like, um, if you can see my mouse, the polar bear isn't there. The portrait of the young man isn't there. They just didn't work as well as, as some others. And on a couple of occasions, only a couple of occasions, the one of the doll I actually turned round to because it helped with the feel of the panel. But apart from that, I did very little um, actually changing anything very fundamentally. So that was my, my first attempt at a panel. And I guess we're now the best part of eight or nine months on. And I started to play around with, with some prints as well, because I thought, well, I must get the printing right and I must get the consistency right. Because again, that's very important that you can't have uh, very contrasty prints next to very soft prints. It, it, the printing must be consistent at fellowship level. Um, and this is just one of my um, sheets of test prints and you can see just look at the one of the ducks and on here they don't look very different but believe you me they are every single one is different until I actually found the one that I wanted 
um, and typical. Um, I did one, two, three, four, five, and six of these, and I ticked that one. That was the one that, in the end, I felt worked. Um, so these were little test prints, probably only um, four or five centimeters by about, yeah, roughly five by four centimeters, something like that. And I've got sheets and sheets of these all on the paper that I had decided I was going to use. And then how do I actually print them and mount them? And originally I had decided this was a very, very personal project. It was done for me. Um, and I had a word with one or two people who had submitted fellowship panels and uh, one or two uh, quite eminent folk on, on the RPS. And I said, what sort of size for fellowship? Um, do I need to go to A3, A, A4? And I was told basically size doesn't matter. <laughs> Print them as big or small as you want. And I think for me, the, the, one of the big decisions, I thought this is almost make or break, what size? These are intimate prints that they are deep within my soul. I, want them, I don't want them to be too big. I don't want them to shout. Um, these are quite small um, images, but very, very personal. So I decided to print them A5. So that was a big, big step because once I'd made that decision, I had to get mounts cut um, and make all my prints to that size. So A5, but they're all in 50 by 40 centimeter mounts, which is pretty much the standard size that camera clubs tend to use and so on. Um, so I did a couple of tests. I, I printed this one off. This was the very first full size print I made in effect um, and put it in a, an amount. And I thought, does it work? And actually I was really pleased. So I ordered up the mounts, um, got them all cut out. Um, so we're now at the beginning of um, 2021 now into the printing. We, we'll have to go back a step in a minute. There's a reason for that. Um, so I'd started printing really at the beginning of 2021, about, about a year ago. Um, and it took me, I think, four months to make the 21 prints in the end. Um, but that's how it worked. And then put the whole panel together. In between, um, I had played around with, with the layout and this was my final layout. And I, I used the RPS template to do it on. And I changed that a few times and I printed it off and pinned it up on the door by my computer and kept looking at it and still changing one or two. Um, and also checking uh, to see if, if it works as a coherent set in terms of consistency. No, there's no print there that, that stands out as being really bright or, or really contrasty. And another one that's too flat, I had to get the printing absolutely right. So I had really thought about the order in which I do things. So I'd, I'd planned out the layout. Um, I'd rewritten my statement. When I looked at the statistics, there were 249 changes to my statement. It might only have been just an odd comma or one word at a time, but I did. So I'd got my statement, I'd got my layout. I'd got a, couple, a, a few test prints and I thought this is, the time now when um, I need a one-to-one a, a -one with one of the panel members. And I'd already had a word with, with one or two people and, and really, really helpful and encouraging advice from uh, members of the RPS that I felt I could trust in, in giving me an honest opinion. And they said, yes, we, you know, this go for it. This is a, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting panel and it should work well. So I had a couple of one-to-ones and, and I'm sure no one's going to mind if I say who it was with. It was with Richard Brayshaw and, and I cannot 
praise Richard enough for the advice he gave me. Um, and if you are thinking of any distinction at RPS, do get the one-to-ones, they're, they're just invaluable. And Richard looked at my presentation and we, we changed one or two little things around, um, helped me greatly with my statement. Um, didn't change it hugely, but changed the order and a few words and it took on a whole new meaning. So I, I'm indebted to Richard for his, his help and, and support. Um, so that was the first one-to-one. -one. And um, that was in the November. So I had another one with him in January and with only a few minor amendments, he said, yes, I, I think that's about as strong as you're going to get it. Um, go ahead. He said, the only proviso, of course, is I can't see your prints because it's obviously on a Zoom meeting and he couldn't see the print quality. Um, and I've always been quite pleased with my printing. I've, I've loved printing. So I thought, well, here we go. So this is it. These are the final 21. So that's the order and I'll go through them from one to 21. So they're not as you would see them on the panel. So these are the 21 images. Um, and that for me was a must. Um, and in the, the panel, these are, um, they're going in a camera club situation, these would fail miserably because they're walking out of the picture, which is exactly what I wanted it uh, to be. And every single image here, the, the, the ethos of the contemporary group is that the images that you, you present generally have a, um, a sort of visual sort of metaphor in them. There is a meaning in every image. It's not, this is not a picture of a seat with some ducks. It's actually more of me leaving a place of comfort and a place of security. That's the metaphor that I was trying to convey in this image. So it's not about, uh, the image is, it isn't about what is it of, it's what's it about, what's the meaning, what's the meaning in what I'm trying to convey to you. Um, all I can say is with anything like this, with a contemporary submission, you have really all in a way got to hope that the panel members pick up on what your meaning is. Um, and I have to say they were brilliant. They really did get into the feeling that I was trying to convey. And again, we're so grateful to them for, for looking at what I was actually trying to say. Um, another one, um, this, this was actually used in a stage play, I think this was left behind and it was the zombies bit. And then I'm wondering, well, what are zombies? Uh, they're creatures with, with almost no, no personality and they don't quite know what they're doing. And I, I almost felt a bit like that at that time. Um, again, you have to look quite carefully at this. You know, I, I thought this, it was a paper mache image of a seahorse, um, but wearing a sort of Superman cape. Um, and I felt again, you know, I, was I trying to be Superman? Um, the drama studio, Drama studio, in a way, is not that different to being in a classroom. You know, you are the, the actor at the front of a class sometimes. Uh, and little things like that, that, you know, I know that are there and, and hopefully you will pick up on them. So I won't, won't go into every single one in detail. Um, this to me was one of the most important ones, the tap being turned off. I mentioned that in my statement. Um, it's a really scruffy, mucky sink that hadn't been cleaned for years. Um, but it had all the character that I wanted. Very, very difficult print to make. I made dozens of test prints on this to uh, make sure that I couldn't, I could see the detail in the taps, but they were black. They really were black with, with age. But I mean, I think hopefully the message in that is fairly straightforward, fairly obvious. Um, again, another paper mache figure. Um, I felt like the footballers there, I felt like I was, you know, under somebody else's control and wanted to get away from it. Um, waste paper bin, again, the ducks on a waste paper bin. There's the U-bend, you know, was I going round that U-bend? I don't know. Um, 
The ladder is the career ladder. So make what you like of that one. And there's an open door in the corner. Do I go through it? I hope I'm not going too fast, but um, I, I can always go back later if anybody wants me to. Um, this again looks a bit like it was set up. It certainly wasn't. This is one of the corridors that, that um, wasn't used very much and it got a bit scruffy. But beautiful building actually, but uh, it's quite badly neglected. But I could see the cleaning going on. Perhaps that was me. Um, but I could see a corridor and, and to me there was a stumbling, stumbling block halfway along. Um, was that an obstacle? Again, all of these minimal manipulation apart from in tonal range and for printing. Um, things like the verticals, I did straighten them up because they were all over the place on quite a few. I did try to make sure the verticals were straight. Um, this one, this, this pool table was from the little coffee bar they, they had. And I just felt that the that the ball was trying to get into the pocket, which is what you're trying to do, and it was being blocked. And, and again, that's exactly as I found it. I didn't didn't actually move anything. That's that was ready to go off to the tip, sadly. Um, but again, that that was the feeling I had that this it was a place of fun, and that pool table would have been used a lot. But now looking very sad. Um, this snowman, I felt the contrast between the pure white and the, the black um, really sort of said a lot. Uh, you know, it, it's almost I felt like I was sliding down the chair into the black. It's the only print, actually, that, that raised any any doubt in the panel. Um, it, the, the, the panel members saw this online but didn't actually see the print. So we had a, a print advisor and the only thing he picked up on any of my prints was that this area was lacking shadow detail and that was quite interesting because I'd actually left that as dark as I could because I felt that the, the snowman was sliding into the into the darkness into the black and that was quite deliberate but um, yeah, I can see why it could be seen as a as possibly a printing fault and I was tempted to take out the scratches down here, but I felt the scratches were important as well. So left them in. And this was right in the very centre of the whole panel. And for me, it was always going to be in the middle. Um, if it had been a linear panel, it would have been the last one. But it's in the middle of my panel. So in a sense, it's everything leads into it, that the silence um, and a silent school is a very strange place. It, it, schools are not meant to be silent. You know, they're meant to be full of life. And the empty coat hangers, well, that to me was, you know, the last time I would hang a coat up in that particular place. The doll was broken, neglected, probably going to be thrown away. So again, made me think. But this, say, is one of the few. I, I did, did turn her round to fit into the panel. It, it, I did take it the other way. Um, another one that looks like it was sort of set up, but it wasn't. The, um, they did do a lot of fundraising and to come in and find the wet floor. And then another of the ducks and I am running and transforming the lives and so on. And again, you can read so much into this. Um, what intrigued me also was just the little decoration stuck onto the bottom of the wet floor sign that was there, just like a parcel. Fairly uh, plain, simple image, this one, just the empty chair with the empty corridor. And you can have your own thoughts. Where does it lead to? Is there light at the far end of that corridor? It's actually lighter at the far end than it is in the... Uh, in, in the foreground. So what happens? Do you get up and leave the chair and walk into the light? No. Um, one, in a way, one of my favorite images, this one, because not only does it have meaning, but I just thought the light on these curtains, those curtains are black and the walls are dark red. 
but um, they work very well um, in the, in the tonal range they have. And that just one single chair, just where it was, just seemed to sort of balance everything up. But again, the pure white inside what is pretty black. In fact, that room was virtually dark when I, I took this photo and just a little bit of light you can see reflected inside into the in the toilet area. Um, fairly straightforward this one, um, having worked in a classroom, I'm not a music teacher, but the whiteboard is there, the empty chair is there, the filing cabinet's there, and the door is just slightly open. Re again, you read into, into it what you will, but it meant a lot to me with that empty chair there. And the clock, a toy, I think it was a sort of toy clock. It hadn't worked for years, but on the other hand, it was quite big. So it might've worked at one time, but it was the time as well, five to eight. And normally I would have probably been in school by then getting things ready. Um, I, I thought about this one for a long time, but actually the more I thought about it, the more I felt this was very important. I saw this as the layers of the onion, because um, there are layers there and you can either think, well, maybe they're being grasped or maybe they're being cuddled. It's got sort of two ways of, of looking at it. And I just felt in a sense, um, it was being held in a place of safety. The shredding, that stands out and the confidential bit. It's the sort of thing that we're always doing in school. We're re removing information. A lot of the information is confidential and if we have to remove it if, if it's, a, uh, um, it's, it's personal and some things we cannot keep forever. And it was a little bit like that for me. But what I did want to do is to keep that little bit of light in the corner. Again, camera club judges would like it. Very important, I felt that just that little chink of light was there. Very difficult for printing to, to keep that from burning right out, but I did manage it. Um, a disabled toilet, of course, but it could have been a toilet in the school, but I always felt toilet in a sense was a place of quiet and solitude as well as anything else. And, uh, but what for me, I was trying to show here was that little ray of light coming down that right hand side and then coming in below the wash basin there um, and the little chinks of light coming through the Venetian blinds. Again, you can read into whatever you like, you can take it in many different ways. Um, and this is probably the only the only image that stands alone in a sense, but it sort of summed it all up. There, this saying was all round Hannah's. It, there were several versions of it, like as a sequence of moments. Um, and it just happened to be outside of this door. And I was lucky to get this because it was, they were actually clearing stuff out of this, this building when I photographed this and I didn't want to be seen, but I saw it and I thought, yes, I really, really do need this because it says so much that you've got life, <clears throat> you've got the moments, but then that bucket was there, caution wet floor. So you do have to be careful. And then you have the sequence of, of um, cupboards on the wall, which are all empty. And behind me was a window um, and reflected in that window were a few bars. And it was almost like those were the bars that were sort of holding me back into a, a job that really now had become too much for me. So that was the last one. So you've seen all 21. Um, just to give you a little bit of background again, um, the time scale you can see I started July uh, 2019 and it took me through to September 21 before I finally took the prints up to RPS house. Um, and I've probably told you most of what's on here, but um, again, what I would stress is the middle bit, November 2020, was that one-to-one -one Zoom meeting. Um, and also, um, 
I haven't mentioned it here so much, but the, the advice and help I got from so many people, um, too many to name, but I say some very eminent RPS members who, who encouraged me all the way and said, keep going, keep going. So in January 21, after I had that one-to-one uh, -one with Richard, I made all the test prints and that was it. Um, finished, took it up to Bristol in September and then had the long wait. Um, and on assessment day, um, I don't know if it was done on purpose or not, but I was the very last panel to be assessed. <laughs> and uh, I think by then I was getting pretty, pretty um, tense and wondering what's going to happen because there had been some lovely work gone through and, and some, some very good fellowships awarded. So I'm not hugely fussed about the technical side of things, but people invariably ask. Um, what did I use? I actually use one camera and one lens for all of those. And people are often surprised to know that it was all on micro four thirds. And the prints, um, there was no ever mention was made of, of noise, which is often what people mention with micro four thirds. Um, and they were all at a reasonably high ISO, some of them up to 1600, but I don't think you would know and say the noise was never never mentioned or sharpness or anything. Um, Epsom traditional photo paper, I can't recommend highly enough, absolutely brilliant. Um, that I've heard rumors they might be discontinuing it, which would be a big shame, but it's beautiful paper. It's cool, it's like a semi-gloss, but it certainly isn't glossy. Printed them all myself. Um, and I just used Photoshop, fairly simple um, manipulation in Photoshop. And I used Topaz quite a bit um, and the black and white conversion, which again, that's been discontinued. The, the, the original Topaz black and white um, facility is gone, which is such a big shame. And I've still got it left on my computer. And um, right at the very end, last thing I would say to anyone, because I'm, I'm guessing some of you may be listening and thinking about having a go. Um, it really, I know everybody says it, it's not about letters after your name, although that's lovely to, to see it, but um, it's the learning process along the way. I've been in photography ever since I was, well, my first camera I had when I was about 10 or 11, I think, and I've been in camera clubs for the best part of 40 years, and I'm still learning, and I learned so much just from doing this this f panel it's taken my what i thought was reasonably good photography to a higher level um the most useful piece of advice advice of all was get all the advice you can get take it and then you've got to decide what do you what you go and, and use because it is your panel um you've got to make the ultimate decision and i, I was told that if it's your panel and you're passionate enough about it, that passion will come through in your work. Um, go to the advisory days. Definitely, you know, there are days available. Um, get, do it. Book a one-to-one. -one. Absolutely, that is a must because the panel members know what they're looking for and they will tell you what they're looking for. And although we have guidelines, and I know this because I'm on the licentiate panel, we do have guidelines, we do have criteria, but they know it far better than you do. So take their advice, um, as I say, absolutely brilliant. Look at the distinctions videos. There are quite a few on the website. Um, Go and watch an assessment day. The, the next one is in contemporary is in um, April. Watch it, get a feel for what the standard is um, between associate and fellowship, for instance. Um, look at the criteria yourself. There's plenty there. Um, and, and look at all the panels on the RPS website. And that's pretty much it. I'm, we said it's about an hour, so I've left a few minutes. But one thing which, which has occurred to me, these are all the sort of bits of advice. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that I was successful. But is there a downside? And actually, there is. It's funny. Um, I was awarded the fellowship at the end of October. And for weeks, I thought, oh, great. This is lovely. I'm really pleased. And now I'm thinking, well, I've spent two years on this. Um, 
what do I do now? I'm almost bereft that my my piece of work, my my um, project is over. It's finished. I really can't do any more to it. Um, so I've got to find something else. So uh, that's the only downside. But apart from that, uh, you know, if you're if you're not sure, I, I hope what what I've done and what I've said might inspire you to to have a go. You know, please do. So that's basically it. Um, I can come out of screen share if you like, Alan. Yeah. And uh, we can see everybody again. Wonderful. I think we've got a, we've only got a few questions. And questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I made one, and I may be getting my Alice in Wonderland wrong, but uh, when the Queen of Hearts said, when challenged about something that she meant it to mean what it what she meant it what she said was what she meant it to mean and not anybody else's <laughs> you think that that's the joy of contemporary that you can uh, it, it's about what's behind the taking of the photograph much more than just what's apparent on the on the image yeah i think that sums it up actually um I say the, the only reservation I had was I know what I'm trying to say. Um, I just hope the panel members do. And I, I'll say it again, to be fair, the panel members were brilliant. They picked up on it. Um, and they were almost in there with me, I felt. And, uh, you know, I can't just cannot thank them enough. In fact, I can see, see Tessa's online. So I big thank you to Tessa for chairing that panel. And uh, um, you know, I, I really give them all the praise that they possibly can. Um, they, they were just terrific on the day. I think, um, and I'm, I'm still at the A stage, I, I agree with all your comments about uh, taking advice. And one of the things that worried the hell out of me before my one-to-one -one was about the quality of my photography. You think, you know, you go into camera club competitions, and I've done it for years and years and years. Um, and I'm not a great competition photographer, I have to say. I, I mean, they're acceptable, but, you know, they don't win huge numbers of prizes. But one of the great reassurances coming out of it was the, the, the honest feedback on the quality of my photography, which, well, one, it reassured me. It meant I could breathe more easily, but, but also... <laughs> I think is a, is a very is a key part of taking the advice because we all work ourselves up to great levels, don't we? And then you need some release when you talk to somebody. Yeah, I, th I think I think that is the difference between the royal and 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 the distinctions and and camera club. And yeah, I enter camera club competitions. I'm not ever fussed about winning them, and I do occasionally, but. To me, this is a totally different thing, and it's the most personal piece of work I've ever done. And not one of those images really would would work. You know, it does need understanding, um, and you do need that statement. And and they they must work as a set rather than individual images. Hmm. Yeah, there was another question here. Uh, great presentation, Ken. Can you say why black and white, and not color? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, people that know me will know that probably 85%, 90% of my work is black and white. I've always loved black and white because um, I think, as you can see earlier on, some of the, my original images were in colour um, and I didn't feel they had the same empathy, the same meaning with, with my feelings uh, as the black and white. And the, the minute I started converting to black and white, I felt it was right. And to me, black and white simplifies the image straight away. Um, and it makes it hopefully more obvious what you are trying to say. You know, you've removed that distraction of colour. Um, and I've always worked that way. I really, really enjoy working in black and white. And I think it's far more expressive. Always have, always have done. And ever since I had my darkroom, I used to do a lot of black and white traditional darkroom printing and, and loved it. So it had to be black and white. I never had a second thought back, you know, making a panel with the color, color set of images never entered my head. <laughs> I, I had the same question for you and made my own thoughts about it earlier on. I thought, well, it was, it was really interesting that you showed us the colors first. 
of your sort of let's say scoping visits and, until you got to the ones you actually did for the panel. And one thing I think about the color is it's noisy. Yeah. Whereas the mono is very quiet. And and perhaps you know sets that tone of the place when it was so empty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it it was quite a melancholy experience. And um, you know you can't express melancholy in color in a sense. Well, I can't anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. We we could perhaps again we'd still go to monochrome rather than be black and white. You know. Yeah. I've got images yeah. which are just all blue, but lots of different tones of blue. Mm. That can be incredibly melancholy. Yeah. Well, the actual prints were that that paper is slightly warm tone anyway, and I my printer allows me to print warm or cool, so it was slightly warm tone on a very slightly warm paper, which mm. I felt worked. I tried about a dozen different papers, but that slight warmth for me it, it helped, and, and it's it's how I wanted it to be. I think the important thing for all of us, uh, and maybe you'll agree or not, is that it's what we feel most comfortable with. I'm always, I'm always, I, I do work in colour mostly, and people say that many of my colours are in your face, but then that's what I like. It's sort of a bit like me, and I guess you're, you're, you're summing up there of of why you use monochrome, is is. is um, a very valid way of we have to all stand back and look at what we want to say and how we want to say it and what's best for us is what matters for us yeah yeah it's almost my my signature i guess i suppose i say people that know my photography will know that you know i'm, I'm happier happier with, with monochrome every time <laughs> Thank you. I've got a couple of comments here. Uh, congratulations, Ken, a very evocative panel, full of emotion and conveys a lot of sadness. Uh, it makes me wonder about the former residents and their lives today. Uh, thank you for that. Another one uh, saying, your project has assured me that contemporary is where my work belongs. I definitely have felt a connection with the story you told through your, your imagery. You're, you're stirring very powerful emotions and lots of people can thank you very much thank you that. thank you for that well that that's what i think contemporary is is about what whichever panel it's got to have an, an, an emotional input f from the photographer it's got to be a personal thing i think that's what the contemporary ethos is about it's personal to you um mm. the, the, not the, the problem but in a way the challenge is to make sure you convey those feelings and you're never sure until it's up there and and you know the panel are going through it but uh, yeah I guess we all have doubts but <laughs> as I did but uh, I'm, I'm glad they you know they, they saw through it and so you know people certainly who've seen it have, have said the same so you know take on board all those thoughts and thank you for them well, I think at this point, I'm going to share my screen and uh, say some thank you. Uh, thanks, Ken. I mean, my statement, it was a fascinating talk, is, is really rather a bland way of putting it because, uh, uh, you know, you talk about your, on, your layers of your onion and your problems with stress, which I've suffered myself in the past. Um, it is uh, wonderful that you've managed that this, the process of doing this project has helped you with that and and thank you for sharing that amazing uh of you to do so it's the first of our three talks from new fellows and i'm looking forward to the next two uh, but first of all I'll say thank you again to sean good goodhart uh for co-hosting the event and and uh well we, we we jointly captured the questions sean um and then finally before i sign off for this evening uh our next talk is given by alexandra prescott frps um who was also assessed on the same day as ken but obviously before you ken because you were the last of the day <laughs> yes. uh, and that's going to be about universal truths and she's going to talk about her journey and her project which led to her panel um and uh, it was, uh, she'll tell you, it was a, a bumpier road perhaps than, than, than Cairns, but it was, uh, it'll be fascinating as well. So I'm looking forward to that. That's in four weeks' time on the 21st of March, again at 7 p.m. So until then, folks, uh, thank you again, Ken and Sean. And thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.
and uh, good night for, from me.